Welcome back to the program. You're watching Newsnight. Now, the High Court ruled today that 10 cabinet secretaries are in office illegally. Judge Anthony Mrima, in his ruling, stated that the CSS, who continued serving the first term and continued in the second term without vetting, should not be in their current offices. The court, in its landmark ruling, saying that the appointment of all chief administrative secretaries is also unconstitutional, as the process was not competitive and not subjected to public participation. Want to immediately get some thoughts on this. First, from the litigant, he's a human rights activist, Okia Omtata, joining us live uh, from Busia County, I believe. While here in Nairobi, in our studios, is an advocate of the High Court, Steve Ogola. Gentlemen, thanks so much for making time for us on this uh, Tuesday evening. And Okia, I want to actually begin with you on this one and uh, just get to hear from you on this. Did you achieve what you are looking for after you read that uh, High Court ruling? Yes, I first of all, um, maybe my network may not be very good because I'm in my house in the village, in Kwangamoru village in Busia County. So I hope you are seeing me well. We are seeing but, you uh, very well. Kindly proceed. Thank you. <laughs> As regards the judgment of the court, I think the judge did a thorough job. He made uh, findings that, were impo that are important to advance the rule of law in Kenya. And as regards the rule of law, I think uh, the clarifications that have come out are very, very important going forward in terms of the rule of law in this country, which is a major, major problem that nobody seems to obey the law, nobody seems to want to do what the law requires. And so to me, the, the ruling was uh, satisfactory, except I'm a bit dissatisfied with the clawback, whereby the court said that there has been a culture which has emerged that the courts are giving very good judgments. And then, and then, uh, like retreating or fearing what the consequences, they begin again suspending them. So I don't know why the court, if something has been found to be unconstitutional, I don't know why the court gets the capacity to extend the unconstitutionality so that the unconstitutional thing continues happening. But the ruling to me is very sound, and is a, a landmark decision that. Okay, uh, we apologize for that. We seem to have a challenge with uh, the uh, connection. The okay, let's give him some time to get that sorted out. Steve Ogola, nevertheless, yeah, here with us in studio. And uh, let me start with you, uh, Steve, on this. Constitutionally, what does that ruling mean? I think, the, uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much, Vega Mora, for having me in studio. And we must thank Okiom Tata for doing a great job. I think he's... Uh, he is uh, falsely characterized as, a, as an activist. He's not an activist. He's number one human rights, human rights defender. Human rights defender. Yeah, I think that's the better uh, characterization of who Okiom Data really is. He's done a great job. Most of the great uh, monumental public interest litigation has been championed by him. But having said that, today's judgment by Justice Mbrima has three limbs. The first one, is the, is, the, is, is the part that the High Court judge has said, cabinet secretaries who transitioned from uh, President Uru Kenyatta's first term, the second term, ought to have been vetted. And for good reason, because when President Kenyatta completed his term, he was vetted at the ballot when voters uh, voted overwhelmingly for him to be re-elected into office for the second term. As a consequence of that vetting at the ballot, he was sworn in. Therefore, it goes without uh, emphasis that the team that he was assembling after the swearing in for the second term ought to have been vetted. Indeed, lawyers raised that question, but I think it was ignored for unexplained reasons. So the court has said that any serving CS that was transitioned from Jubilee's first term, the second term, ought to have been vetted. And I think that there's some convergence with common sense in that position. The second limb, which is at the twin limb, that relates now to the office of the chief administrative secretaries, mm -hmm. there's the question of the procedure of establishing those offices, creation of those offices, and again, the procedure that was used to fill those uh, offices. The court has faulted both. Well, the court said the creation of the office of chief administrative secretary, this is an office in the public service, is not an office in the national government or the national executive. Being an office in the public service, the procedure ordained in the law ought to have been followed. And that procedure is, once the president writes 
to the public service as he did on 23rd of January 2018, the Public Service Commission needed not to have responded so much in a rush as they did on 24th of January 2018, barely a day after the president had written. What the judge has said and what is also provided for in the law is that the Public Service Commission ought to have invited the Salaries and Remuneration Commission to consider the financial implication of the creation of that office and the salary grade. Because of the financial burden or stress, those new additional offices would have on our public budget, a public pass. Also, the Public Service Commission ought to have considered the justification. And having been satisfied with the justification and the financial burden, and still arriving at the decision that those offices were needed, the judge has said that looking at the procedure ordained in the Public Service uh, Commission Act. These positions ought to have been advertised. Persons who are interested apply, shortlisted, interviewed, and then persons who are qualified, nominated and recommended for appointment. Then the president would then nominate them, take them to parliament for vetting before final appointment and swearing in. That did not happen. The procedure for creation of that office was not followed. The procedure for filling those vacancies was not followed, and therefore the judge has said in totality, the creation of the Office of Chief Administrative Secretary is, un is unconstitutional for want of procedural and substantive compliance with the law. Steve Ogola, and, and I hope we are, we are still uh, figuring out how to get Okia back on the line. For those legal minds who feel that there was nitpicking on this part, that by and large the president did establish the office of the CAS in accordance with the recommendation of the Public Service Commission, there's proof that he did reach out to the Public Service Commission, there's proof that they responded. You, you know, there are those who say that uh, this is much fuss over nothing, and you did hear what the Secretary General of the Jubilee Party, Rafael Tuju, felt on the same. I was a bit disturbed by Honorable Tuju's comments, but then, towards the, towards the end of his interview, he conceded that he has not read the judgment. It's a 98-page judgment. I have labored to study it carefully, and Honorable Tuju conceded that he's waiting to be advised by the Honorable Attorney General. So to that extent, I'm happy to permit him for the errors that he made, that for, 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 the, for the innocent mistakes that he made when, while he was commenting on the judgment. But be it as it may, the person at fault to be fair, is the Public Service Commission. There is a letter that was dated 23rd January 2018, where the Office of the President sought, sought advice from the, from the Public Service Commission mm -hmm. as to whether they can establish a new office to be known as the Chief Administrative Secretary. It is the Public Service Commission that rushed the process, therefore leapfrogging and sidestepping the SRC. Had the, chief, had the Public Service Commission stood its ground or advised the President accurately and correctly in the law that allow us more time to consult with SRC to understand the financial implication, allow us more time, Your Excellency, the President, to understand the rationale and the justification for creation of this office. Allow us more time to get public input in terms of public participation. Allow us more time to be able to advertise and to fill these vacancies competitively. Then the Public Service Commission would not have responded to the president with approval within a day of that request. Mm -hmm. So this problem must be located right at the doorstep of the Public Service Commission. But it, Yes. Let me, let me bring in uh, Okia on that, and, and I have some tweets that I do need to bring up uh, shortly. Okia, so what happens next? And you've already vent, uh, expressed some of your frustrations with that suspended judgment, uh, but what happens next? What's your next move after that ruling? My next move is that I always, I always uh, seek to enforce the orders that I get, and I will see as the time plays out, I'll, I'll seek to enforce the orders. I'm also considering appealing against the decision by the judge to suspend his decision because I don't think he has the capacity to do that. If you look at Article 2, Clause 4 of the Constitution, which says anything done in violation of the Constitution is null and void. So if it is null and void, how can you give it any legitimacy, you see? And Article 2, Clause, I think it's Clause uh, 3, it's very clear that nothing can be close to say it's very clear that nothing can be done in violation of the constitution. So 
To me, I think that uh, the judge made a very good ruling, but maybe because of the political environment, whatever, he tried to give the government a soft landing. And so me, I look at it that the, the judge has dissolved the cabinet, and the president, I think, should uh, move ahead and do the right thing in reconstituting his cabinet. And if he wants to set up uh, this chief administrative secretaries, just as a land advocate or Gola has observed, let him follow the due process of establishing offices and then the due process of filling them. There's no, there are no shortcuts. And uh, the days when the president had the power to do what he wishes in this country are no longer there. But, this, but in this particular case, as uh, Mr. Gola has rightfully pointed out, the people who messed the process for the, the Public Service Commission. Mm -hmm. And we have this problem whereby commissions were supposed to be able to stand up and speak truth to power, but our commissions have been packed with the loyalists and they have become truthless and they have become arbiters uh, and uh, they aid in the violation of the law. They don't stand up for the truth. And this is a problem we're having in all commissions. The reasons for the purpose for which they were created is never realized. And if the commission had acted professionally, there are chances that I would have gone to court again if this particular issue would not have arisen. But because they did a short job mm -hmm. and the very short year, I felt compelled to move the court and I was okay. joined with the court. The Human Rights Commission joined in and we able to urge and the Law Society of Kenya also supported the case, Katiba Institute supported the case. And we're able to achieve what we achieved. Okay, I want you to hang on there because I want to get uh, two pieces of feedback uh, on this particular matter. One is a tweet and the other is a, an SMS that's come in. Uh, we can put them up uh, on the screen. We can start maybe with the, the first one. This one is from an, another advocate of the High Court, Donald Kip Kourir. He says, the High Court has countermanded and voided too many decisions and appointments of and by the president. Judges don't make decisions in vacuo. Steve, I hope I've said that correctly. Mm -hmm. But based on filed pleadings and submissions made, Office of the Attorney General has lost too many cases as to amount to professional negligence. Okay, that's the view of one. Uh, do we have the other one as well? This uh, has come in as a text, and I'll read some of your feedback, so keep sending them in. 2242 is the SMS line. Hashtag is Newsnight. This one from David Murade of the Jubilee Party. He asks, do they vet cabinet secretaries in the second term of the U.S. president if he chooses to retain them from the first term, since our Constitution is largely modeled after the U.S presidential system. Steve, I want you to have a go at this first before we go back to Okia. I think I already answered. The president himself is vetted at the ballot. For him to serve a second term, he has to subject himself to the ballot. When he gets the nod of approval by winning a second term, he is then sworn in. And when he's sworn in, he has the liberty to reconstitute the cabinet afresh. When he's reconstituting the cabinet, Everybody who served as a CS in the first administration is deemed to have been fired and then deemed to have been hired afresh. And I think there's some convergence between what the judge is saying and common sense. If you served in the first term of the president, that term ends when we go to the ballot. When the president is sworn in, you are assuming a fresh mandate that is identical to the duration of the president's term, which is five years. I think let us not split hairs and draw unnecessary parallels between what the Constitution provides. It's a very plain and straightforward reading of the law. Point is this. The CSS, that transition ought to have been vetted. They, some of them were not vetted. They now need to be vetted. There is a moral conversation that is now emerging. What the judge has done, Oiga, is to give the president some wiggle room to try and agonize about the consequence of this decision so that if, he's, if he has the liberty between this time and, the, and during the pandemic, before this COVID uh, pandemic is, is, is over, mm -hmm. or maybe it has been declared contained, he can now begin to reorganize. We expect and we appeal to His Excellency the President to first and foremost respect and recognize the bindingness of this judgment to, re to reorganize the cabinet within this duration, there's a window there that he can do so, not to prefer an appeal on this judgment. And Donald B. Kikorid is right. If you look at, because I litigate a lot at the Constitution and Human Rights Division, I can tell you, it is not just professional negligence. I think there's some casual approach 
in the manner in which the government is, is, is appreciating some of these cases in court and defending some of these cases, because some of these cases raise very straightforward questions. For instance, can you really appoint a chief administrative secretary who is a state officer without subjecting that person to parliamentary vetting and approval? The short answer is no. Why would then these people be appointed, sworn in, in a, in, in a process that is opaque? When you have a constitution that requires public participation, you have a constitution that requires that public offices be filled competitively. In short, Waiga, the High Court has reprimanded the executive that, listen, you must act within the four corners of the law, and where you have not acted within the four corners of the law, we recognize that you may need time to reorganize so that disruption of services is minimized, but in the end, we want to see that before Jubilee's term is over, all these cabinet secretaries that were not vetted are vetted. All the CAS, the, uh, the, the, cabin, the, the CAS that were appointed and competitively have been recalled mm -hmm. and the process commences afresh. Steve, it sounds like you're not giving room for an appeal. For you, it, uh, that doesn't sound like something you would they, recommend if your client was the executive this no, evening. They can appeal, they, they, you know, the opportunity for appeal already exists in the law, so we don't need to overemphasize that. But this is what they must do if the government prefers an appeal. They must first and foremost request the Court of Appeal to give a stay of execution of this judgment. Because if they don't get a stay on the judgment, then that judgment remains live and they are duty bound to comply until such a time the appeal has been determined on the merit. So will they get a stay? We don't want to speculate on that. With their appeal, we cannot speak for it. Okay, and before I allow Okia to come in, let me ask you one last question here, Steve. Are there other possible uh, loopholes or weak joints in the Constitution or in the setup of the current government that could possibly fall or fail to a similar decision or a similar fate like this one? For example, some would question the appointment of deputy ambassadors without being vetted. I think the principle has been settled in this case, so it's upon the government to solve such and to identify appointments that were done without adherence to procedural and substantive provisions of the law. If you start, if you start, if you start reviewing the appointment done in the last three years, you will certainly come up with some appointments that may fall short of constitutional and statutory requirement. I think in terms of realigning, if government wants to inspire public confidence in our justice system, they must lead by example, and they can only lead by example if they obey court orders, if they align their decisions to match the outcome of the courts. There is something important that Okia raised, and Justice James Odek now uh, may his soul rest in peace. In 2018, during the lawyers' annual conference, he spoke at great length. He presented a paper on the place, the legality, the propriety, and even the constitutionality of these suspended judgments. He said it's a tool that courts have used to try and create a balance between preserving the, preserving the status quo for purposes of transition, smooth transition, without necessarily negating or undermining the substratum or the gist of a judgment. That debate has not been finalized. I think it's time we revisit it, because okay is right. If you go to court and you extract, an, you extract a judgment that says the constitution has been violated, as a litigant, you'd expect immediate compliance because when you create room for, when you create room for in the way of suspended judgments so that the executive can realign its decisions to match the judgment, sometimes they don't do it. I can tell you there are many instances where the government has been given opportunity and they have failed. In this in, uh, Jubilee's last term, Justice Onguto now late, in his, one of his judgments, he directed that the composition of the cabinet must comply with the two-third gender principle. Mm -hmm. And he stated clearly that should President Uru Kenyatta win a second term, the first thing he must do when, he re, when he's reconstituting the cabinet is to adhere to the two-third gender principle. All of us are aware that when President Kenyatta reconstituted the cabinet upon his re-election, that was not respected. And there are many other examples where courts have given suspended judgments, but government has been slow in implementing. So a litigant like Okia must be at pains 
trying to understand why the judge can declare the office of chief administrative secretary as unconstitutional and still give government room to correct and then the government won't take that opportunity. I think that is the dilemma he's facing. Okay, let me ask you a question from one of our viewers, Geoffrey Otieno, and you had actually begun by saying you celebrate this ruling. Uh, that's before, of course, the, the suspension uh, that came in at the tail end of that. But one viewer uh, wonders, we're just a few months away from the end of the uh, second term of Jubilee. Really, what has been achieved? That's their concern or, or question or thought this evening, okay? How do you respond to that? Is there a case of too little, too little, too late? This is a ruling that is not aimed at Jubilee. These are rulings for posterity. And uh, that's the importance of this ruling that we are clarifying the constitution of Kenya and what can be done and what cannot be done. That's the thing we'll be matter for that, so that the timeline for Jubilee or the next elections are not an issue. The issue is that Kenya has got a constitution and the rule of law must, pre must prevail over everything else. And the president is under the law, not above the law. That's what's important. And the court has reaffirmed that. And that one. It's a big gain. I would like to respond to Mr. Mrade, who, who talked about the U.S. Constitution. First of all, the Kenyan Constitution is a much, much more advanced document than the U.S. Constitution. For example, over on the issue of making uh, presidential appointments, the Kenyan Constitution is very, very elaborate and has prescribed what needs to be done when a president makes an appointment. It limits the power of the president. It's very clear on the issues that can be done and cannot be done. The U.S. Constitution is largely silent on the issue, and a lot of that, hap a lot of what happens, has been mainly matters of tradition and procedure that have taken place in the Senate or in subsidiary legislation, in in uh, in, 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 in legislation, not subsidiary in legislation, and not in the Constitution itself. Mm -hmm. It's very important to appreciate that even even a, even an institution like the Supreme Court. Is not clearly established in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Constitution. It's just mentioned in passing, or the, the Chief Justice. I mean, it's just mentioned in passing. So, I think that when you hold up the U.S. Constitution or the U.S. culture as the standard, you should realize that the U.S. Constitution has, is, is slightly inferior, and in many ways, many very very inferior compared to what the Kenyan Constitution is in terms of prescribing, in terms of limiting power. And if you have looked at what happened in the U.S. last time, you'll find that the U.S. president has almost rogue powers, which a Kenyan president who didn't have. If you looked at how Trump behaved in office, a Kenyan president who didn't have that kind of leeway. So let us not keep on looking at the U.S. as the, as the standard bearer or as the ideal that we should work towards. We have surpassed that ideal. We have got our own ideals. And our ideal is the constitution of Kenya, which we must implement. And it, it prescribes what must be done. And we must go by that. I know, I know this is a bit late in the day to ask you this, but I'll still ask it. What initially motivated you, Okia, to move to court on this particular matter? The rule of law. Three simple words. Rule of law. Yes. yes. And, when that's the main, and, that's, and that's the problem Kenya has. Mm -hmm. If we embrace the rule of law, we sort out our problems. Okay, I asked you earlier how far you're willing to take this. Would you take this to the Supreme Court if that's how far... You sort of it will take to uh yeah if, 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 if they appeal it i'll fire i never give up a fight i never give up a fight and i enjoy the fight the the, the in fact the, the the heavier the fight the merrier i look at this fight as a blessing so if they are going to go to the court of appeal that will be another blessing and an, and an opportunity to make further clarifications of the law okay you you enjoy the fight is what you're saying well, let me ask you this, I enjoy this fight you enjoy this fight steve let me ask you this what happens when you look at this, uh, and a lot of discussion has been had over the last three years about the relationship between the executive and the judiciary. Is a ruling like this, could a ruling like this further sour the relationship between those two arms of government? I think a ruling like this one uh, improves that relationship because nothing stopped the judge, nothing could have stopped the judge from declaring the office of the chief administrative secretary as unconstitutional and, de and declaring the holders of those offices to be continuing to hold those offices illegally. But you see now, the judge and the court, the judiciary, is continuously agonizing Wahiga. How to create a balance between defending the constitution and the rule of law without disrupting government functions. Remember, the president has complained before 
that their t government is tired of injunctions, injunctions, injunctions from the court. Government can't function without, because every time it, has to, it tries to do something, the courts issue injunctions. And the court, the court also agonizes over this position that the matters that come before us are merited. And if you had done things the right way, we would not need to intervene or interfere or countervail some of your decisions. So they are trying to create a balance. There is a point there that Okia has said which must not get lost. This kind of litigation, Waiga, is the kind of litigation that may be in the nature of public interest litigation. If you understand the scope of public interest litigation, it has benefits that go outside or beyond the judgment. First, it records or documents a grievance, the challenges that Kenyans have. It also animates the constitutional mandate that the Constitution has bestowed upon Kenyans to rise and defend the Constitution every time they feel the Constitution has been violated or threatened with violation. Number three, it can actually also bring real change. Also, some of these judgments give us an opportunity to test the independence of the judiciary. And I think in, on that point, I tend to agree with Honorable Tuju because he said, and he noted correctly, that in that regard, our judiciary is I can say for lack of a better word, our judiciary is a judiciary from the future. The way it is checking the executive, it is animating its mandate in the manner in which the constitution had hoped to achieve. So I think there's some kind of benefit in this kind of litigation, whether government complies or not. But there's an important point that would go to the former, the former Attorney General Professor Gidi Mugai. Professor Gidi Mugai told us in one of those many legal forums that the way government operates sometimes is at variance with practical legal reality. He can render, an adv he can render himself or a, a professional legal opinion as the Attorney General, but can he give assurance that political actors will comply with it? Maybe even the, the present Attorney General, the Honorable Kiara, uh, 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 Kiara Karioki, probably is rendering good advice but that good advice, when it arrives at the table of the executive, there are other political interests that mitigate. So I'm a bit slow in terms of uh, condemning wholesomely the lawyers working at the state law, the lawyers defending some of these cases. But what I want to urge mm -hmm. the executive is this. Can you please inspire confidence in the manner in which you receive judgments from the judiciary? It doesn't show good example if the executive is leading in disregarding and disobeying court judgments. Already, Waiga, we have 41 judges that, are, that remain unsworn. Now there are 40. Mm. We have this judgment that has declared the position of chief administrative secretary as unconstitutional and illegal, and the process leading to the appointment must be restarted. The question on the street is, yes, Steve. will government comply? Okay. Will wanna, government withdraw? I want our viewers to think about that as I give feedback. Steve, you've got a very optimistic outlook on, on where this will end up. Some of our viewers might not agree with you. This is what they are saying. Uh, let's start with the tweets first, and I'll read the SMSs. Uh, Ino Kilile says, there have been several attempts by some crooked lawyers and members of civil society to arm twist and frustrate the executive. The focus has been too much on the checks while forgetting about the balance. We need an equilibrium. Okay, someone there giving their view. Let's take a look at another tweet. Uh, Gikundi Mugira says, tell Okeo Mtata that we might not offer so much to him, but at least majority of us are grateful that he is Kenyan. We wish him longevity. He is a gem generally. Okay, interesting way of putting that. All right, um, Willow Willis has an extreme view there. All CSS should be fired immediately. Their offices are not only unconstitutional, but a burden to the taxpayer. That is the view of Willow Willis. Let's take a few more. Uh, Marco Oseno says the AG has largely misadvised government on this matter. He should take responsibility as such. As a country governed by the rule of law, we must as a country address ourselves properly to existing law to the letter. Okay, let's do maybe one or two more, and then I read some SMSs. Uh, Kagwe Kanini says, very objective points by Steve Ogola. The issue of public participation in our constitution is highly insisted. And okay, I think we've got one more here. Let's see, this one is from uh, Collins Bohr. 
Uh, Okia has been consistent in his quest for justice and respect to the rule of law. The problem is the continued disregard of the law by the executive. As TG puts it, it's a storm in a teacup. He knows it won't be adhered to. And I've got two SMSs before I get final thoughts from my guests. Um, a person here, you don't give us your name or where you're messaging from, but you say, where were our members of parliament when this was happening? They never questioned the appointments. They are the people's eyes. While Robert Oseko Kayago from Eldoret says, if they were vetted during the first term of the president, is there any need for them to be vetted for the second time? Are they not the same people. Gentlemen, we are out of time, so I'll just get a, a final thought from each of you. Okia, you say a looter continua. You will follow this till its logical conclusion? Okay, Okia, you seem to I'll, have I'll muted. Follow, I'll, I'll follow it to the, its logical conclusion, and I think uh, the logical conclusion is the rule of law, and the law will prevail. People like Tuju who are thumping their chests are, are, are living in a bubble that will, just, will soon burst. They think, they think that they low unto themselves, and they are not. Tuji is virtually nothing in this country well, compared I, to the law. It's nothing. It's nothing compared to the law, so you cannot, and even if they disobey, mm -hmm. these orders are there, and even when they leave office, we can, who says when Uhuru leaves office, he cannot be arrested and imprisoned for not obeying the orders the courts have been giving. His immunity only ends when he's in office and it will be ending in a few months' time. So they need to know that this, these orders we are getting are not in vain and the, the law does not die. So if they disobey the orders, we shall just wait for them to leave office and we shall arrest them and lock them up. Okay, well, I don't think you have the, uh, the part to arrest anyone, okay? You're, you're speaking very confidently. It's the, the court will give orders on the way forward, I believe, is, is more of what you're no, saying. No, once the regime changes and we get a new regime, I'm telling you, those who have been violating the law and breaking all the manner of things will be dealt with. Okay. That's why we are heading. As a country, we are heading towards a situation whereby everybody is accountable. This question of impunity, if this question of what I do does not arise, the law is going to be supreme. And as it is written in the Bible, that the Lord, the Mount Zion will be raised up at the highest mountain and the law shall go forth from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. I tell you, the law shall go forth from, from the parliament of Kenya in Nairobi to the ends of the republic, to every corner, to every heart and every hamite, the law will enter. And I'm telling the time. Okay, we seem to have lost him on that, but I believe uh, you've gotten the gist of his closing argument. Uh, for you, Steve, uh, lessons learned, way forward, I can give you a minute or so on this, and in case you want to respond to any tweet or SMS there. I think let's look at the positive side first. The positive uh, development from arising from this judgment is that now it has been settled that in any future appointment of uh, chief administrative secretaries, mm -hmm. that position will be competitively filled and they'll be vetted by parliament. The elephant in the room is, is the president magnanimous enough or willing to provide leadership by recalling the existing chief administrative secretaries. I think if he did so, he would have cemented his legacy as a president that is pro the rule of law, as a president that respected judicial determinations. Lastly, not every determination from the High Court is deserving of an appeal. As lawyers, we win some cases, we lose some cases. This is a plain reading of the law. We've already understood that the Public Service Commission misadvised the president by accepting to rush the process and by sidestepping the Salaries and Remuneration Commission. Be it as it may, can we then not appeal this judgment but have a framework that allows us to take corrective measures to inspire confidence? And I agree with Okia. We do these things for posterity. This administration will look back and say, when there was doubt, people went to court. When the court provided clarity, we respected and we complied. They will then have the courage and the, and the courage of conviction to question the decision by the next administration why they cannot follow suit. That is what I can say. Thank you so much. Uh, that is the state of the nation, the state of 
our laws, the state of our democracy this evening. Mm. Earlier on, we spoke with the Jubilee Party Secretary General, Rafael Tuju. He gave his thoughts on this. And at this time, we have been speaking with Okia Omtata, uh, human rights activist, activist, actually, is what he's put on his uh, Twitter handle. No, Steve, it's on his Twitter handle. So he's the one who's uh, termed himself that way, or defined himself that way, joining us from his village, uh, celebrating the ruling of the court uh, and stating that he will see it through till its logical conclusion, which he says is the rule of law. And here, in studio, we've been speaking with Steve Ogola, who sees uh, two sides of every coin, including this ruling. There are positive aspects, uh, but there's a lot uh, in terms of what could happen moving forward on the same. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. And to our viewers, thank you for tuning in uh, to Newsnight this 20th day of April 2021. Remember, we do this every Tuesday, speaking to politicians, uh, policy holders, leaders uh, from different sectors to understand what is happening in the country. And we certainly hope you've been better educated. On behalf of the whole team that's made this broadcast possible this evening, thank you so much for tuning in. My sign language interpreter tonight has been Yula Nzale. My name is Wahiga Mwaura. Have a good night. Stay safe. Adhere to the law and we'll see you soon. Goodbye.